Reverend Carla, welcome to Spirituality Matters. Now let's settle in to find that sacred space between here where I am and there where you are. And let us be reminded that the Holy transcends our physical bodies and our time together is just as meaningful and sacred as if we were sitting beside one another. Okay, let's get started. Uh, Today's podcast is titled Keeping God in a Box, Discovering the Holy in Our Daily Lives. So I do... I did press pause last week uh, for a much needed break just to recover from the flu and do a little bit of my own spiritual reset. Uh, We like to give you um, a little forewarning when that happens, but this was just something that felt right. And I really appreciate you offering me grace and having a week off, but we're back now and feeling just fine. Now, today's podcast is the theme around it is undefinable sacredness. And this was a phrase that came to me recently when I was writing about uh, for this upcoming project. I keep saying stay tuned, but things always take a little longer than what we expect. And but the deliverables are coming very, very soon. And this this undefinable sacredness really is a great term for my spiritual journey. It's certainly not where I began but it's where I find myself now. And it's a place that I never want to leave. People will still try to put me in a box of some kind. If I share anything about my faith or my spiritual journey or some of my practices now, when I share a little bit about what I believe or where I've come from and who I am now, they'll say things like, oh, well, you sound like a Unitarian Universalist or are you unity? Or they really, they need to define me, which by the way, I'm neither, but not that I'm opposed to them. It's, I am spiritual, but not religious. And even though uh, the Unitarians and the unity has a, they both have a massive expansive table that extends beyond some some of what you find in organized religion it still isn't me i'm not affiliated with either one of those this is my journey and what i share with you is my experience so also try to describe with people people's reactions when they find out that i am an ordained interfaith inner spiritual minister because sometimes they're reactions to that can be very interesting. Um, And just for the record, and I've said it before, but I know it bears repeating that interfaith part of my ordination is simply an acknowledgement of that, that all world religions and traditions hold a sacred element of wisdom. It's making sure that when we, when I, I like, I love to describe this massive expansive table of humanity of which we're all part and nobody has the right to gatekeep and then how we show up in that humanity and about what we believe about our faith experiences there should be room for all of us here but sometimes that isn't the case in our spiritual means that you can you can have a spiritual experience outside of religion now I don't know if you're hearing something, but there's a little five pound dog behind me getting a drink of water. And I knew that would happen as soon as I got, if you're, if you're looking at this on YouTube, you could tell I'm in a different place. And even though I've blurred the background and I have a grand dog that decided it was time to get up and drink water. That's okay. Uh, For those of you who know, I'm a huge animal lover, big animal welfare advocate for many years of my life still am, of course. And so there's dogs always surrounding me somewhere and cats too and sometimes a bird and a rabbit. But I wanna share a experience one time as I was talking about, I've done some videos on this, but I don't know that I've ever talked about it here on this podcast, but there was a time where um, I was trying to explain being an interfaith, inner spiritual minister to someone who said, the conversation started out by them asking me what denomination I am. And I said, I'm, I'm no longer affiliated with the church. I'm an interfaith, inner spiritual minister. And they like, oh yeah, that's like my church. We're non-denominational. Like, no, that's not quite the same thing. And I don't want to take too much of a deviation here at this time, but most non-denominational Christian churches have originated from some denomination. They're theological beliefs oftentimes 
very much uh, align, especially in the evangelical tradition, where many of them will find a model, a business model that they follow. For instance, the Hillsong business model. Many of the Amar modern American evangelical churches are using that as a business model that makes it sound like non-denominational is non-conforming when it's absolutely not true at all. As a matter of fact, there's the, the, th the theology that's there that's very patriarchal and also oftentimes, um, you know, where being gay is a sin, um, women aren't allowed to preach or hold, hold, uh, leadership roles as a pastor, for instance, as a head pastor, even if some of them do ordain women, um, women take a submissive role, um, uh, LGBTQIA plus community might be welcome to come in and sit in the pews and, and sing and tithe, but not necessarily be a part of, of leadership. I'm starting to see several churches now like that who are having support groups for the LGBTQIA plus community. And based on what I am hearing back, and I plan to do uh, an extensive research on this, uh, I have been, it's taking a while and do a podcast on it very soon about what this is. It's all passive conversion therapy, no matter what it is. If they are not completely embracing and accepting uh, the LGBTQIA plus community for who they are, stepping fully into, uh, into their authenticity, I don't care how, how you spin the support group, it is passive conversion therapy, which means that you don't accept them unless they uh, turn from quote unquote, uh, their lifestyle, their, their words, not mine, and that they don't accept them fully. They will not baptize them. They will not officiate in marriage. They will not, uh, ordain them into leadership and, and things like that. So when someone tells me they're non-denominational, it's a big difference than saying that I'm an interfaith, inner spiritual minister, as you can imagine. So what I like to say Oftentimes it's not going to end in a good place. I'll say you need your need to define my faith is a reflection of your indoctrination into your religion. Your need to define my faith is a reflection of your indoctrination into your religion, but it has no relevance on my spiritual journey, nor am I obligated to try to make my faith fit into your God box. So let me, so going back to the title of this, Fitting God in a Box, let me pause here and say that even using the name God was something that took time for me after leaving church. Part of it was because I was so hurt and angry that someone who had dedicate, dedicated her entire life and believed and wanted to immerse myself into that, um, into that ministry, I couldn't understand how this had happened. So I no longer wanted to believe in that God of my religious heritage, but my indoctrination into my religious heritage, that also compelled me to believe that I had no right to a relationship with the divine outside of my religious heritage. So you, it, this happens to a lot of people who finally leave uh, church is that you you're rejecting that, but you you're carrying those indo indoctrinated beliefs with you. So they still impact you in certain ways. And it certainly was impacting me. And that's why I say it's important that leaving church is not enough. Actively deconstructing from Christianity requires us. It, it allows us to untangle from those indoctrinated beliefs so that they no longer influence us or have power over us. So I think that that's a, a real important um, pro part of our process. Uh, many people, and you know, we've talked a lot about deconstruction here, but many people will deconstruct a certain element of their religious heritage and still find community inside the, the church. And that's okay. There, it's not about the end result, no matter what your deconstructing journey is, it's not about the end result. It's about where do you land on this journey so that you can be who you are and whatever that faith looks like after the deconstructing is exactly what 
it's supposed to be. And for me, it's constantly evolving. It's, I wouldn't say it's people who say, well, it's changing because you're changing your mind. That's not true. That is absolutely not true. It's evolving just as humanity has, has evolved. When our ancestors worshiped the sun God, because they believed that some um, being, supreme being actually lived in the sun and that they were, they were making that God happy when they offered sacrifices, some of them incredibly barbaric, where they offered their children and they threw them in vol volcanoes and think, thank goodness that we evolved away from those, those uh, uh, traditions but also that understanding, it's more than just saying, oh, those are, those are barbaric. We don't do those anymore. It's also that we understand through our awareness that there is no being there, that it's all part of the creation of the divine. It's all part that we're intricately connected through this undefinable sacredness. So how important it is to release some of what we tried to understand and move into a place where we embrace the not knowing and being okay with it. That's the part that people often don't understand about my journey is that how do you go from being an evangelical where everything is black, white, up, down, no gray. This is the way the Bible is read. I just saw a video right before I, I was posting on TikTok and right before I came on here, I saw a video of somebody um, saying that they didn't understand why somebody where you ask about God, who, the God in the, in the Christians, old Testament, Christianity's old Testament that says, uh, he took great pleasure in the smell of blood and the great pleasure in, uh, instructing some of, uh, the people to smash women and children up against the rocks, that this was somehow pleasing to God. And, the minister saying, well, that's being taken out of context versus going to the other side that says the Bible absolutely says that being gay is a sin and that's not taken out of context and how that happens all the, how that happens all the time, which I believe is one of the reasons that so many people are still leaving church. I talk about that all, all the time. So when I deconstructed, deconstructing for me became something where I released my understanding of the divine of, of what I knew at that moment. And the, the, the divine, the holy, the God consciousness expanded beyond my understanding that I knew from my religious heritage. And I started to embrace this, not knowing I was okay with not fully understanding who or what God is and not trying to define it. All I can say is that I fully reject the patriarchal anthropomorphized God because I have seen firsthand the harm that that has caused and that we are seeing throughout this country right now. I'm, I'm um, just a few days out recording this just a few days out from uh, Florida passing the don't say gay bill where everybody wants to scream. Well, it doesn't say that. Okay. Read between the lines, sweetheart. It does say that. And you know exactly what you're doing. If you're backing that bill and you are denying the humanity of your fellow state members. And it's, uh, it's horrific what's happening in quote, the name of religion, the name of this anthropomorphized uh, patriarchal God. But if that's what your faith is, I always say that, that if that's what your faith is, if, if defining God to fit in that box works for you, that's great. But what I just said about Florida, the one caveat that I would say there is it is never okay and it will never be okay with me and millions of others to use your religious beliefs as a weapon to condemn, oppress judge or influence politics in a way that it inhibits the way the rest of us live and breathe. That is not religious freedom. That's religious oppression. You know exactly what you're doing. That is never okay. Human rights should take precedence over religious beliefs. I don't care if I have to say that every podcast, y'all just get used to it. Um, keep it on a post-it note and remember that every time you see that, that that is what we are fighting against right now.
There's no hiding what's happening in this country. It's full, it's full in full view right now. They're not trying to disguise it as anything else other than what it is, which is suppressing the rights of others based on this radicalized uh, extremist Christian view where only the white Christian male is not at risk of being somehow uh, their rights suppressed. And, you know, I often say that about even the women who uh, support some of what's happening across this nation is because they have internalized that those beliefs, they believe in this. And that's, that's, that's the classic example of what it means to have internalized misogynistic views. If you believe that you are inferior to males based on this uh, anthropomorphized pastry, pay, uh, being that said that the male is dominant over you, then you have internalized that misogyny and you are contributing to the suppression of other women because you believe that. Okay, uh, let's move on. I'm going to get back to uh, this whole concept of undefinable sacredness because I'm never too far away that what's happening in this country is never too far away from my heart and my mind. Um, I feel like we're not talking about it enough. We're not screaming about it enough. We should be, but it always brings me back to that. Those who have who fear losing control will use whatever means they will to try to maintain it. It will, it is not sustainable. It will not last. Whatever victories they're making right now will not stay because we are evolving. So that is a beautiful segue to sit here in the moment with this undefinable sacredness, which is what I call my faith journey, my, my spirituality now. And that is a segue into this week's blog, because as you know, I write my blog and then based on that blog, I come here and talk about, I expand that conversation. And so let's go into a little bit about what I wrote. I started the blog out by saying that had you told me uh, that I'm, I'm four and a half years out now from being ordained an interfaith, interspiritual minister, um, that I would be here. Uh, talking on a podcast, writing a blog uh, with a, over a half a million followers on TikTok, I don't know that I would have believed you. I didn't know. I knew I was being called to teach, but I had no idea what that was going to look like. And long before I became ordained, I, I had started writing these, what I call 3 a.m. thoughts. Um, and some of, them, some of them are poetry or my version of poetry. And some of them are life stories, which I call we stories. And I'll explain that in another episode. And some of them are workshop ideas. And some of them are the blogs that you receive here. But whatever they are for me, they're a lifeline. Um, they actually feel like that, that one line from Hamilton that says, right, uh, why do you write as, your, uh, as if you need it to survive? And I do. I know it's like a lifeline for me now. Um, and I was just reading uh, a book from Creation Spirituality by uh, Matthew Fox, and uh, he quotes someone who says, write as, write as if you're dying. And I, well, we all are, you know, that, that's the thing. What is our, what is your genius? What is your, what, what, what are you here to create? And for so many of us, it's different things, but it's finding that thing that feels like life to you, that life force. When you, when you think of it or you dream it or you know you're, get, you're going to get to do it, what fills you with so much warmth and love, all I can say, beloved, is go towards that. That's why I'm here now. That's why I knew that whatever isolation I feel from the communities that I left, that I lost, that little dog's barking every once in a while too. I think my voice is annoying him. So that's what you're hearing. Um, everything I think I lost was worth it. I'd much rather be in this space knowing that these words touch you. I read your emails. I see your DMs. 
I'm sorry, I can't answer them all, but I see them and they touch me deeply. Sometimes they touch me so deeply that I can't reach out to them because uh, I'm trying to stay in a space of focus and to pause and open up that part of me is more sometimes than I can uh, take at this time. And maybe it's because I feel like we're, we're in a spiritual triage season with this sense of urgency to move forward as lightning fast as we can to be the voice for the people who are most marginalized, but also those people who are leaving religion in droves and who are looking for sanity, for spiritual sanity, to know that they are okay and they're going to be okay. And I know I'm, I'm very, I can even hear it in my own voice, um, this time away and maybe being sick. I was sick for about 10 days and um, having some quiet time here, um, taking care of my grand dogs. It's making me very thoughtful, uh, very uh, pensive. Um, I don't know, maybe it's the, the full moon coming, but all of it comes back to this undefinable sac sacredness and how do we, how do we move towards it and live in it. And I want to stop here and say, and I go a little bit into this with the blog where I have, and I've, I've said this before in my writings, I have never said that the entirety of my religious heritage was bad. I cannot say that because even what my grandmother, my, my staunchly devoted Southern Baptist grandmother instilled in me was the quest for longing to be closer to the divine, to understand that. And so even as she saw me changing and moving through different uh, denominations and becoming ordained in the, uh, as an ordained elder in the Presbyterian church, which she didn't understand at all, but she was still very proud of me. And she asked a lot of questions. She still supported me in ways that her denominational beliefs would have rejected, but she didn't. She didn't. She would say, well, I don't understand it, but I can tell you're happy and you're going to do really good work because you feel, you feel called to that. And she got it. She got it. And as I thought about some of the things I wrote in the blog, and you'll see, I write about her and I write about uh, the prayer circle that I'll go definitely go into more detail about that. When, after uh, my first child, I was only 17 years old. I was a little thing in labor for 32 hours. I'm not going to go into anything graphic right now, but um, I could not walk after giving birth. I was paralyzed from the waist down. And after a prayer circle of women, the next day I got up and walked and the, the way the women nurtured me in throughout my years and the great friendships that I had, it always comes back to the women. It always comes back to the women who understand what it's like to create sacred community and the ones who aren't afraid to push out beyond the barriers of that religious dogma. Because if you don't think that you're invoking something that goes beyond your religious, your religious dogma, when you're in a prayer circle, when you're in a prayer circle, sitting there and praying over someone, oh, that's, that, that dives deeply into your religious, into your ancestral heritage. That takes you back into the embracing that the unknown, this undefinable sacredness, this, this place where throughout the years, throughout generations, we've tried to capture this energy with different names and different beings. Even in the Hebrew Bible, you hear God being expressed in a multitude of ways with Je Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Rapha, Nisi, Shalom, Ra. The Lord is our shepherd. The Lord is our righteousness. The Lord is here. Cutter, please. There are many, many other names when you start to look through the, the Bibles, but the Bible, but not just in Christian heritage, but in so many other different ways. And why is this relevant? Why is this so relevant? Because when we hyper focus on just taking the Bible literally, like we have to read that as if our translation 
is the right one when it was all written in Hebrew, in, in uh, Hebrew and Greek and uh, Syrian Aramaic, and we're supposed to know exactly when it didn't even have punctuations. When we know that some of what is part of our Bible didn't exist with the original manuscripts, but okay, let's hold on to this literal translation and this is the way we're going to manipulate people's lives for thousands of years as if we have the right to gatekeep this holy, undefinable sacred that we call sometimes the spiritual gift of the Holy One, the Holy Spirit that moves and dwells and lives with our being how can we possibly say that we have all of that wisdom inside us beautiful souls i've been studying this stuff since i was six years old i went back to college in my 50s to go to a bible college and then to study at arizona state university in two years at seminary and what i came away from all of that knowing is that i don't know and how can I be closer to any peace that surpasses understanding by coming out of the other side of the spiritual wilderness and being okay with not knowing? Why does that bring me peace? Why do I feel good about telling you that what you believe is just as sacred as what I believe as long as we can sit at the table beside one another and respect it and be in awe of each other and how our experiences might line up and how I can be inspired by what you know. Now, let me tell you a little bit about what I know. Oh, the beauty that's, that's we have the capacity to, to create in this time, how we can actually be a part of bringing heaven on earth. If we would just let go of this imaginary gate, this lock that we think that we have the right to hold on to and try to keep others out. That's not how it works. It just doesn't work that way. And my, my grand dog agrees. Give me one second. Cut her. Please stop. Go lay down. Hey, you know what? It is what it is. <laughs> That's what you get when I'm recording at 5.30 after being, I'm just happy to feel better. I was sick for a long time. So this is the first podcast back. This is what you get. Maybe this is the new me. I don't know. So let's see what else we got here. All right. So here's what I like about what's happening right now. And it's not going away. No matter how many no matter how many books I hear that on the horizon are several of the mega pastors are getting ready to write books about the deconstruction, about deconstructing. And I hear that there's a lot of churches who are setting up these quote support groups inside their church for the deconstructing community. And then I hear, I read all these articles about, oh, what it means to really deconstruct. Here's the truth. You can put whatever spin on it. Cause I'm telling you, if, if the people, if the marketing, the marketing that goes into the modern evangelical, the American, Americanized Christianity, if the marketing that they did, if they would give that wisdom to other people, you'd see a lot more other uh, influencers being successful because they can market things very impressively. So now they're taking on the deconstructing part to put a spin on it. Because why? Because before social media, we didn't have a platform. Before social media, we didn't have a place where we could come together and meet. And then we started to have language. Like I, I said, I always said that I never used the word deconstruction until I came to TikTok because I always called it like, well, I'm just untangling the great untangling from my religious heritage that no longer serves my highest good. And then I heard somebody use deconstruct and like, oh, that's cool. I like that. I'll, I'll start using that. And that's how it all started. And it just grew from, it just grew from there. I didn't start it. I'm not, I'm not taking ownership of it. Someone out there did. And I'm so glad they did because they can continue to spin it just like they can, they refuse. They continue to try to make it be that the reason we left church 
is because it was inconvenient. So what you see that's, that's released from inside the studies that they say on why people left, that they, that they market, that they market out to the real world, like, well, they never had good faith, too many uh, things in the secular world that's competing with religion, um, God is on the back burner, all that stuff. None of that, none of that is true. I think some of the most devoted, hardworking, committed people to spirituality left. And it's because we did exactly what the church told us to do. And that was to take our faith very seriously and take our ownership of our spirituality. And when we actually read the Bible and when we actually got tired of not getting answers to our questions and we saw the hypocrisy and we saw the inconsistency, the way judgments were wielded and the way finances were not disclosed, we walked out never to return. And that journey has led us here to be together. And I'm so thankful that we are because out here in this undefinable sacredness, we have found each other. And even though I don't have a complete understanding of who or what God is, I embrace the unknowing and I don't think I'll know in this life, unless we have some radical awareness, which a lot of what's happening right now with this, this tension, that's what it is. People never give freedoms. People fight for them. Throughout history, people have fought for freedom. And that's where we are. We're in another one of those times where people who are afraid of losing control are hunkering down on those things for people who are saying no more, we've gotten this far. Now it's time to take it to the next level so that people can live freely in their spiritual and hum spiritual authenticity and humanity because they deserve that, which the people who have historically oppressed have denied them. So that as part of my spiritual integrity, as part, as part of my spiritual walk, that is what I'm here to do. And so I do that by embracing this undefinable sacredness and saying that whatever this is inside me is strong enough to make, to compel me to move forward and to continue to do this work. So even though I don't have a clear understanding of who or what God is, just knowing that somehow I'm a part of this is enough that somehow, even though I don't have a full definition of what the divine is, I, it's going to be okay. I have a sign on my wall at home that just says, I am. And I got that many years ago when I was still indoctrinated into my Christian evangelical heritage. It just says, I am. And I remember one time somebody saw that sign, someone who is actually should, should have known what it was, um, who was churched and they saw it and they laughed and said, what is that? And I was surprised that they didn't know because it actually comes from a time when Moses, who didn't want to believe that he had the power to speak on behalf of God, turned to God and said, well, who shall I say sent me? As if it's not enough that God physically spoke to you and gave you these commandments or these directions. Moses said, who shall I say sent me? And God simply replied, tell, tell them I am. Tell them I am. Beloved, whether that is for you or for me or for that little dog barking right now, who hasn't barked the last few days I've been here? Maybe it's my energy that's changed as I, as I record this. 
the divine lives and breathes and through, through us, each and every one of us. And we don't have to understand except just be. Because I'm here and you are. And somehow that is enough that we are sacredly bound in this space and time. For a time such as this, we are together. For a time such as this, we can move forward. Healing from the things that broke us. And moving towards things that serve our highest good. And by doing so, we are honoring the presence of I am in our lives. Blessed be. Okay, beloveds. I'm honored to be in this space with you. And the dog decides to be silent. I pray you receive something. I know I did. This teacher teaches what she needs to hear. But now, beloveds, go in peace and be at peace. Go in love and may you be loved. Go and know that others are on this journey with you and you are not alone. You are seen and deeply and unconditionally loved just the way you are. I'm so honored to be back. Blessings on your week and I'll see you soon. Bye for now. <laughs>